I'm with the AV crew. I'll be doing the recording for Linux Fest here. And presenting to you will be Tyler Smith on Docker. Here he is right here. Take it away, Tyler. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to be talking about the what and why of Docker, kind of a high-level overview of containerization. So I got started in web development in 2017, right? And every time I went to Stack Overflow, Twitter, just looking up how to do something with C uh, like CSS, right? Just lurking in the background, waiting for me, was this Docker thing, like shack behind the tree. You couldn't go anywhere without it. And you would hear about, oh, you know, having containers and immutability and all this stuff. And at the end of the day, all that I could think is why? What is this? This is overwhelming. I'm doing WordPress and FTPing files up to a server. So today we are going to talk about the what and why of containerization and try and demystify what some of this is, why you might use it. And hopefully we can all learn something along the way. So who am I? I'm Tyler Smith. I am a principal software engineer at a company called Autodesk. Um, I study public relations in college, so I do not come from a tech background, and I was bad at deploying software. I would like to say that now I am better, good is still a far ways off. So what are the goals for this talk? We wanna understand kind of the historical strategies uh, and challenges of deploying web applications, right? We wanna um, <coughs> learn what Docker is, and how um, it tackled some of these challenges that we've historically had. And then we'll go and take a first glance at what application deployment might look like in the future. Um, so non-goals for this is we're not gonna master Docker. We're just gonna be talking today. We're gonna be getting a sense of what it is. So the World Wide Web was first introduced in um, 1989 and became generally available. It was made by this guy, Tim Berners-Lee. And in the early version, it was just text and links. And while it was a technological marvel, there were no cat videos. So <laughs> it is up to you to decide how useful that might be. But in 1995, um, we got the form element. We got the image element. Um, in 96, we got CSS. And also in 95, we got JavaScript. And all of a sudden, this became a really compelling platform for going and deploying applications, right? One of the things that was really different about the web uh, compared to some of the things that came previously was you didn't need to go and install an update on a computer if you wanted to go and push a new version. You would just put it somewhere, someone would reload the browser, and everyone would get the latest version. Right around this time in 95, you also had all of these open source languages and projects coming out. Perl in the late 80s, PHP in 94, 95, Python and Ruby around the same time. And what we're here to talk about today, Linux, all concurrently. And when you take this new thing, the World Wide Web, and you take these open source languages and operating systems, eventually you get nonsense like this. So, that's right. So we're going to go and talk about kind of the things that got us to here, how we were deploying applications in the past, and have an overview of some of the options that have been available to us historically. So application server management. In the early days of the internet, right, we're talking early 90s, we didn't know if this was a fad or not, and we were just starting to have things like rack-mounted servers. This is an ad for an early compact one. It was about $5,000 for this kind of newfangled server. And um, in today's money, I think that would be a boatload. I didn't do the math on that. But you would go and maybe buy one of these and you would just want to put everything on this because the web was new. You didn't know if your investment was going to pay off. So if you had a web application, you were gonna put it on that. If you had some kind of email server, you were going to put it on that. Anything that you could go and put, you would put on this single box. And that was kind of how things went. Now, that was fine, but over time that can create problems, right? Um, I'm seeing some people in here, maybe around my age. How many people remember Windows 95? 
Okay, pretty much everyone. Anyone remember um, what was colloquially known as DLL hell? DLL? Uh, yep, dynamic link libraries. I'm seeing some nodding heads for the viewers at home. And what that was is maybe you would have a, a game that required DirectX 4 and a new one that required DirectX 5. And now you try and install it, everything's broken and you can't go and rectify that situation. In some of the early days of this single server strategy, what you might have is a shared dependency between some of your servers. Uh, maybe you would have, you know, in the, the kind of early 2000s, one application needing one version of Python and another one needing version three. Some of us lived through that. Um, you could also have maybe applications where you would need a different version of a database that wasn't exactly backwards compatible. So this didn't always exactly scale. Now, there were a lot of enterprising people in the early days of the internet trying to figure out ways to make this a little bit easier. So we ended up with PHP. PHP was a language that was some kind of unholy amalgamation that was made to literally go and uh, count the views on someone's personal homepage. That is what PHP originally st stood for. And then somehow it went to go and power about 80% of the internet. Um, probably not the best language, but one of the really compelling things about it was to go and upload files. You could literally drag them and drop them from your desktop to a remote server. And this was really compelling. This is where things like WordPress which powers about 43% of the sites on the internet right now, came to its popularity. Uh, PHP BB for bulletin board software, Drupal, Joomla, PHP MyAdmin. The deployment model was so simple that it really took the world by storm. But this is not a great way of doing things. Uploading files individually is slow and clunky. And when I started doing WordPress development as a freelancer in 2017, this is how I would do it. And you would try and have some efficiencies, some gains, only upload the files that have changed, and then you realize you missed one and your entire application is broken. Or if you're working on a team where you're all doing this, you have your version that uploaded a change that the other developer made, and everything is broken again. So this is also not the greatest strategy for going and deploying applications. Now, as we head into the late 90s, early 2000s, we start getting virtualization and the cloud. So um, I wanna say that VMware came out in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then you would have um, virtual private servers in AWS around 2006-ish. And what you could do is take one computer and break it up into different parts. Now, that's really good because the cost of hardware is going down and you have this big box that you can go and break into a lot of little tiny boxes. And while that's compelling, and maybe you can run a PHP app and a Ruby app and have MySQL and Apache and have all of it talk to each other, you end up with this problem of managing state over time. These servers, especially, you know, you're buying one, it's $10,000, it's gonna be running for a while. Maybe you work in a university. And all the while, you're going and installing software on it, you're running updates, your coworker did a few experiments on there that didn't pan out, and there's just all of this stuff in clutter. And it's really hard, after these have been deployed for a few years, to reason about the state of the system. And when Jim, who had been managing this server for years and years, finally left his dishes on the counter next to the dishwasher one too many times, and his wife had enough, and he is in shambles not coming to work anymore, it is now an investigative Sherlock Holmes-ish effort to understand what's going on on these servers over time for the coworkers that replace them. So you're going and getting hardware advances, but you're having the state management problem. The other problem with virtualization, and this is specifically for things like VMware, where you have your on-premise server and go and break it from one machine into several machines, you're going and also emulating the hardware. 
you're going in pretending that you have another CPU. You're running another kernel if it's running Linux. You're going in pretending that you have all of this RAM and that is not zero overhead. So headaches persist with some of this stuff with state management and new strategies are formed. One is this idea of a golden image. You go and figure out the ideal state of all of the software that should go and be on that server. And then you create an image that you flash. And an image is like kind of a snapshot of what the operating system should be. And you go and install it on every single server. You know and understand the state, hopefully. Now, sometimes what happens, and I've had this happen to me, is on a DigitalOcean account, someone just goes, puts a backup and says, this is our, our golden image. I ask what's on it, and the developer says, I have no idea, but we know that it works. So many, many, many times, this starts as a good strategy, but it doesn't end there. And then you go, and as time goes on, in the early 2010s, a new breed of tools for configuration management comes on the scene. You have Ansible, Puppet, and Chef. But these come with their own problems. With Puppet and Chef, these are both Ruby-based tools, which means you need to have Ruby on the machines that they're targeting, and they are going and pulling from a control server, which sounds great. They're always checking for updates, going and looking at a regular interval, which is great until you go and push a bad configuration change to your command and control server, which everything goes and grabs, and you have just taken down your entire fleet. This is not great. And all the while, this is kind of the history of web application development. I one time had a job where I, to set up the application that I was working on, I got a 40 page document of here's everything you need to do. And it was overwhelming with the amount to copy and paste. So finally, we have one more big challenge that we have to face, local development also known as works on my machine. How many people here are programmers? Raise of hands. So about half, right? How many of you have said in the last month, works on my machine, don't know why it works on yours. <laughs> okay, a little less than half. That's great. I am very jealous. Um, it is kind of the final frontier with going and developing locally. There are tools like Vagrant and um, VirtualBox where you have some kind of virtual machine, MAMP and WAMP if you're kind of in the PHP world, Homebrew if you're on Mac OS, but you're kind of trying to do like a Unixy environment. Maybe you're running Debian or Ubuntu, or maybe you're running Windows and deploying to a Linux server. And that is a special kind of um, headache. This is the backdrop for what we're gonna talk about with Docker. And I wanna be clear, these are all historical methods, but all of these methods are still being used today. I have used almost all of them myself in some form or another, just the same way that radio didn't replace newspapers and television didn't replace radios. These tools and these practices are still here. They still serve a purpose, but there's a better way to do some of these things. So I wanna go and recap kind of what the challenges are. We've complicated undocumented steps as we're going and installing things, you know, especially if we have like an incident and you go and do a quick patch, but that doesn't make it into your documentation. But documentation is always up to date, especially internally. So maybe we don't need to worry about that. Um, we have changes made outside of configuration management tool. One of the problems with Ansible and um, all of its friends is you can go and tell the server, here's what you can do, but you can still go and log into the server and make changes yourself, which your configuration management tool doesn't know about. You have conflicting dependency. You're kind of like the DLL hell thing that we were talking about. You have the infamous works on my machine kind of an incoherent approach to local development. And when we were talking about that, I mean, a lot of time on the same team, you'll have five different methods.
Um, you have emulating hardware, which is pretty resource intensive. And kind of the noisy neighbor problem if you're doing something like shared hosting with PHP, where if you have another site that gets a lot of traffic on your same server, it's gonna slow your site down. So this is a backdrop for where we talk about containerization, and specifically Docker. Docker is an open source project that was introduced in 2012 at PyCon, I believe. Um, and it came out of a company called DotCloud, which was a platform as a service like Heroku that was trying to find a way to go and capture some of these things and solve these problems. It's based on some Linux technologies and some things that are really core to the kernel, but you can go and run it on Windows or Mac OS versus this Docker desktop application. Now the biggest thing, kind of the foundation of everything Docker is the Docker file. This is a file that goes and keeps all of your configuration. It has a base image that you're pulling from. You go and define, hey, here's the port that uh, this container is going to publish. I'm going to go and install a few system level dependencies. I'm gonna run some commands, here are my users. Let's copy some stuff into the container, run some more commands, and this is my service. This right here was an innovation because everything that lives in a Docker container lives in this. Let's take a little bit of a closer look. I know that it was small on that last slide, but there's not a lot going on here. And you can go and capture every single thing that is happening in your service. This is a small Docker file. A lot of times they end up larger, but you can go and put your dependencies, you can put what users running it, all of the things that are being copied, all of the commands. And really what you're going to use day to day, these are the commands that I use in my Docker files. That's what, seven of them? You can learn this extremely quickly. And it's kind of like going and installing some of this stuff yourself, but it's a little bit different and we'll get into that. So right here from, it's cut off a little bit on the proje projector. Um, if it wasn't, you would see that first line says from node 18. Now, where does that come from? That comes from a service called Docker Hub that is from Docker that has all of these images that you can pull from that let you base your containers off of that. And what are those at the end of the day? They're built with Docker files. Now you can also find things on Docker Hub like image or uh, services that you can just download, be it GitLab or Home Assistant or Jellyfin. We're not gonna talk about that too much, but there are some self-hosting sessions um, here at Linux Fest. I just came out of one that Alex gave on self-hosting and he's going and running some of this at home. And you can just pull these images down and consume them, which is really, really powerful. Now let's talk just briefly about the difference between images and containers. Most people don't use this precisely. Docker files build images, which is just a static thing. And that is the um, seat of the operating system. It's immutable. It is an image. And then images create containers. If you do object oriented programming, this is kind of like the difference between a class, which would be the image, and then an instantiated object, which would be the containers. Um, most people are not super precise when they talk about image versus container, so don't get too hung up on that distinction. But now that we know what Docker is, that we have this file that has all of the steps to go and create our services, Let's see how Docker uh, tackles some of these historical challenges that we've had setting up our services. So challenge number one, undocumented setup, right? Maybe you have things that have happened that weren't recorded on your internal documentation or some system level dependency that you just never knew about. How do we solve that? Docker files. We record everything that needs to be installed there. This is our node container again. Right there on line five, we are running um, app get update and installing FFmpeg and image magic. Maybe this is a service that needs to do video processing or image processing. This is no longer an implicit dependency somewhere. 
this is absolutely stated within the Docker file that this is needed. Next, um, changes meet outside of tooling, right? Maybe something's on fire, there's an incident, someone SSHs into a box and does something that um, they don't record to the internal documentation. And you don't know about it until you need to go and fire up another server and then load balance between them. And now there are these implicit dependencies. So how do we solve that? Every time we go and make a change to our service or application or change the Docker file, it's gonna rebuild the whole thing. If it blows up, it's gonna blow up fast. And usually this is done within like a CI process. Um, does everyone here know what CI is? I'm seeing a few hands. So for those who don't have your hands up, it's a way that every time you go and make a change, you go and build your whole application, run your tests, etc. CI is short for continuous integration. It's a really good practice to make sure that your software is always in a working and deployable state. And every time you go and make a change, Docker is going to go and recreate the whole image. Now this sounds like it's gonna be really slow. Like, oh man, like I just wanna make this one change. I have to install all of these dependencies. Sometimes dependencies aren't things that you just have to install. Your package manager will go and pull down a bunch of C source code and you're just waiting for it to compile for 10 minutes. What's cool about Docker is you have this like idea of caching, right? So for anything that you're copying in from the file system, it's going to look and be like, hey, has that file changed since the last time I built this, right? Has package.json changed or package lock? Nope, still running with the same dependencies. And that's the first thing on here. So we're going to go and have these layers that we ran previously, keep them, and we're just going to go and rebuild the parts that have changed. And Docker has really intelligent ways of looking at the file system, seeing what things have changed and only rebuilding the minimal parts that you need to get a new image. So it works really, really fast. So another problem that we have is conflicting dependencies, right? that kind of um, DLL hell, or maybe you need Python 2 and Python 3 or two different versions of MySQL. So how do we handle that? We use multiple containers plus some kind of orchestration tool. Now, kind of the big scary orchestration tool is Kubernetes. If you've been, you know, Docker adjacent or playing with it, you're going to hear that a lot. I have personally not used Kubernetes. You also have this package made by Docker Inc. called Docker Compose. And it's a YAML file where you go and define your services and you can just go and break it out into individual pieces. That if you have different services that need different dependencies, you just create different containers. And you can go and create virtually unlimited containers. You're, going, you're bound by the amount of CPU you have but you're not doing things like emulating hardware, which makes this much, much faster. Um, so let's talk about another challenge that we talked about with some of these old ways of working and deploying software. It works on my machine in local development, right? The real nightmare ones. So once again, we have Docker Compose, which was kind of this thing. You define all of your services and when you run Docker Compose up, everything just starts. If you have a database, it starts. If you have an application, it starts. You can map out dependencies. If you need like a web server, you can put Caddy in front of it and it'll go and grab your um, TLS certificates. It's a really, really powerful paradigm. So you can use that same thing within um, your own local development environment. But another feature that makes this really powerful is this idea of volumes, where you have your local copy of your files and you take those and you mount them into the container. So you have this package version that you've built with your Docker file. And when you start it using this volumes command and you pass it something from your host and where it's gonna land in the container, and you say, hey Docker, just go and put those in this place. So once you start working on your local development environment, you are working inside of Linux, even if you're on Mac, even if you're in Windows,
and everything's just going to work. And you are going to be much, much closer to the environment that you're deploying to than the environment that is on your machine. There are a few exceptions, but that's fine. Um, probably the most famous um, kind of meme in this space. I don't know how many people have seen this one, right? <laughs> it works on my machine, <laughs> then we'll ship your machine. And that's how Docker was born, right? This is a really powerful idea because you get much, much closer and you are less likely, not completely, not completely saved from, but less likely to run into some of those big works on my machine um, problems. Now, another one is emulating hardware is resource intensive. This is what we were talking about for VMware, right? You have to go and have, for every operating system, it's going to have its own kernel, you're emulating the CPU, you're going and pretending to be a lot of stuff that's not there. What's our solution for that? We just don't do it. When you're using Docker, every single Docker container is using the host kernel from the machine. Now, if you're on Docker desktop, that's a virtual machine that's pretending to be Linux, but it's only one. And if you have one container or a hundred containers running, they are all going to go and use that same kernel without having to go and virtualize, you know, the entire stack of all the things. Now, we're going to briefly just talk about how containers work. Um, each uh, container usually contains a full operating system. So it's not the most efficient thing in the world, right? You deploy a Node.js container, usually you're going to be shipping Debian or Alpine Linux along with it, along with all of user space, cat, ls, bash, or sh, you're still getting a lot of files. Um, all things share the host Linux kernel, um, the namespaces, in the kernel limit what the container can access. So even though they're all running on the same machine and all using the same kernel, they can't talk to each other other than if you go and say, hey, I'm exposing this port to the Docker network. And C groups limit the resources available. So if you're like, hey, I don't want this to get more than two gigabytes of RAM or something, you can go and limit that. Now there are a few gotchas with Dockers. Um, layers are an important thing to know about. Every single operation you make, whether you copy a file, whether you run a command, those create a layer, which is inspectable. And you can go and really shoot yourself in the foot by maybe having a secret enter the container during a build step. Don't go and pass secrets in during build steps. Use environment variables at runtime. Another gotcha is environment variables. I wish I could say that works on my machine is not a thing. It is, and usually it's because you have an environment variable that's misconfigured that you need to work with your team and make sure you're all using the right stuff. Um, you can have gotchas with maybe the, the host uh, Linux kernel doesn't have some feature that your application needs. I personally never run into that. Linux file permissions are another big got you. If you're developing on Linux, where you're going and mounting your files within the container, and then you're going and making changes, since you share the kernel, all of the file uh, permissions for the user IDs within the container exist outside of the container. It's a mess. Use Docker Desktop if you want the easy button. And then there's the idea of stateful containers and non-stateful containers. Containers work best when it's for applications, where you're doing compute things. They're not the best for databases. You can use them for databases. If you're operating at internet scale, you probably shouldn't. I do um, a lot of database stuff for my own projects and containers, and it hasn't bit me yet, um, knock on wood. So a bit of a recap, right? These, un these complicated undocumented setup steps, they go and exist all inside the Docker file, right? Changes outside, no, everything exists in the Docker file. You make a change, you rebuild, you're now back to the state of the Docker file. Conflicting dependencies, you go and pull out into their own containers, works on my machine, you're going and working a lot closer to where you're going to deploy this. Instead of an incoherent development environment, you can just use Docker, which if you deploy an image with Docker, it's much, much closer. 
you're no longer going and emulating hardware. You're just having one kernel and having it shared between your containers. And you don't have to worry about the noisy neighbor problem because you can go and define resource uh, limits within your containers. So just briefly, um, what comes after Docker? I don't think Docker is going anywhere. I think it's going to be around for a long, long time. If you learn it now, that investment is going to pay dividends. But um, this wouldn't be complete without talking about Podman. Podman is an open source uh, version of Docker. It's almost completely compatible with Docker. And it has a better security model and a less restrictive license. When you're a really, really big organization using Docker, there can be some licensing things. So if you use Podman, you can get around those. And the other is NixOS. Um, there are some talks about Nix tomorrow that look really interesting, and I'm going to be attending those. Um, one of the things about Nix is it's immutable. Um, you go and define your entire OS in a configuration file, and you're not having to go and have a bunch of different operating system files at once. Everything's in here, and you get fully reproducible builds, which you don't with Docker. You get close but sometimes some of your dependency versions can get out of sync. Um, so I wanna go and recap some of the goals that we had for this session. Understand the historical strategies uh, and challenges of hosting web applications. Um, we've learned how Docker handles some of these challenges and taken a first glance at um, what comes after Docker. But again, just like um, radio didn't replace newspapers and television didn't replace radio, these are all gonna be around for a while. Anyway, that is my talk. Thank you so much for attending. I believe I have time for uh, questions if anyone has them. Yeah. You talk about uh, tools like Portainer and other web UIs to make kind of managing all the containers on the server easier. I could if I knew about them. Okay. Um, I, I mostly just use the command line and um, sometimes you know the actual Docker desktop application. If you're using something like Docker Compose, which is the way that I usually interact with Docker, where you've got a YAML file that goes and defines all of your services, running Docker Compose up, down, Docker Compose build, that gets you most of the way. There are probably some UIs that really help I'm just not familiar with them. Other questions? Yeah, I'm very new to Docker as a student, and I'm curious as to when and why you would do a persistent build versus a non-persistent build of Docker. A persistent, so the question is, um, when would you do a persistent versus non-persistent build of Docker? Is the question like when you would go and use like stateful images, like a yeah. database? You kind of went over this, like, Yeah. So when you would use it is when you don't want to use a managed service, right? Really the argument against having state in your containers is containers are intended to be a little bit more ephemeral, um, but you can go and put all of your state in a container. Now, one of the things that folks like Kelsey Hightower, who's really in the Kubernetes and Docker space will say, is it's just best if you've got like file storage or a database to pass that off to a managed service. It's really, really hard to do those things well, um, especially in an environment like Docker where things are meant to be created and blown away. It's kind of like, you know, being at the center of a, of a galaxy and you've got stars being created and destroyed. Um, where you would do it is where you don't care and have kind of lower risk applications, right? Like my personal applications that, that I host, you know, I, I make backups once a day and everything's in a container that's got a volume that persists the data. And if that was to go down, that would be a bummer. That would take me an evening to set everything back up, but I don't have users depending on those services. I think the, full answer to the question of when you would use that is when you don't have critical uptime requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Do Docker files get automatically updated when you change things to like the dependencies on the images? When you run Docker build. Okay. 
Um, now, if you're in an environment that has CI, right, that will, in your deployment environment, go and get the latest. Um, if you change a Docker file, you are gonna have to rerun the build command. That is another foot gun that I didn't mention on here and something that I run into in my day job sometimes, where it's like, oh, the web app's broken, what happened? And someone added a dependency to Django and we just didn't know that we needed to rebuild. So that is a place. That was interesting. Someone was just screaming in the hallway. Um, yeah, so um, it won't rebuild automatically. Um, you'll have to rebuild it yourself. But you will run into those problems a lot sooner than you would with some of these other strategies. And the solution is always the same. Just rebuild. Thank you. Yeah. So in your, uh, in your day job, have you run into any issues with the new upgrades to build the X versus the old Docker Compose build? No. Okay. But I've, I've, I've heard uh, some people uh, complain about layers are getting, uh, uh, they're getting cached in ways that they weren't expecting, things weren't necessarily building and so on. Yeah, I, I haven't run into anything like that. Our use case might be simpler than um, something that would cause those kinds of weird caching issues. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So how is the performance? So you know, we talked um, virtual machines have an open mm -hmm. head. This is clearly doing layers and aliasing yeah. and replacing. And so if not free, what is the overhead on Docker? Right. So the question is, what is the overhead on Docker with layers and maybe you're running inside a virtual machine? Um, so if you are on Windows or Mac OS, there is an overhead every time you go from the virtual machine and cross over into the host machine, specifically when you have files mounted from your development environment, right? Um, where you're going to feel this most, at least in my experience, is if you do JavaScript development, because the node modules folder, which is where JavaScript dependencies live, just end up having hundreds of thousands of dependency files, and every single one of those is a round trip from the host to the, um, to the virtual machine. Now, if you don't have those files mounted, there is almost no latency. And if you are developing on Linux, there's no latency. Because um, it's just going and using um, some of the features that are built into the kernel to, hey, this is all running on the same host. We're just going and isolating these pieces. Um, but if you are developing on Windows or Mac OS, and you have a lot of dependencies, every time you make a round trip to go and grab a file, you are gonna feel that, um, and it will run faster on the host. Yeah. Could you speak to the state of security and how it's evolved with containerization in general versus something like virtual machines? Um, not with a lot of authority. So the question is the um, state of security within containers versus virtual machines. Um, there is a bit of a foot gun within Docker where you're going to want to treat it generally, kind of like you would with a server, where for anything that doesn't need a privileged port, like port 80 or 443, you're going to want to run as a non-root user. Because if you have a root user, it can still do things. And if you're going in self-hosting um, your Docker host opposed to using Kubernetes or cloud service, like there are escalations that you can do from container running root to the host operating system. Um, typically, you're going to want to avoid running root as much as you can, but I am not an expert in container security. Most best practices still apply. Um, the thing that's nice about the container security model, though, is you have one root process, and it's not like system D. So like all the things that would normally be running in the background, of a, like a, a VM or bare metal, where you have your um, ports that are open for the time server, I forget what that's called, I think it's port 53, um, some of your like cron processes, all of those, those go away because what your container is running is just your application and what your application instantiates. So 
security doesn't go away, but it does have a different risk profile. Other questions? Yeah. Now, if you're running SE Linux on the host, mm -hmm. um, the Docker does require access to the file system as root or does it? If you really lock down the host using SE Linux, I'm assuming that may interfere with the Docker, is that right? Probably. So the question is, what's the kind of implications of using SE Linux um, with Docker. SE Linux, for those who aren't familiar, is security enhanced Linux. It is Linux where you take your operating system, dip it in Amber, and make it really hard to change and do stuff with. I have never used SE Linux, so I don't know what running a container on SE Linux would be like. Um, Probably the most common way that containers are deployed outside of side projects is going to be using some kind of managed service. Um, some kind of what service? Some kind of managed service, like um, AWS. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, Elastic Container Service. Um, you can go and self-host Docker, Kubernetes, and that's a really good option if you're looking to go and host something for cheap, like a side project. If you have a mission critical app that people are paying you for, um, it may be better to use a managed service that is just geared towards hosting containers. And that is one of the biggest benefits of containers. And since it's a well understood format, you can just hand it to a managed service and it can figure out how to boot it and take care of it from there. But I don't know exactly how it would interact with uh, SE Linux. I'm struggling with the concept of root. Like yeah. Docker versus root as a host. It is the same root. It's the same root. That means you, you're on UID zero yes. in, inside the Docker. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Which is why for any application that doesn't need a privileged port, you're going to want to create a non-privileged user in your yeah. container. Yep. Now, no, with, if, I'm, I, I have a virtual host on Linode. Yeah. It's set up using, I guess, what's called a hypervisor. Yeah. So the root on the hypervisor level is different than the root on my level, or is it? On the hypervisor, probably. In Docker, no. Okay. Because it is using, it is delegating to the exact same kernel. Okay. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, if there is another one. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed this. Cool.